if we saw the same thing twice. Um, so if this new block C uh, contains no flic conflicting transactions and contains possibly duplicate transactions, let's call it a sibling instead of an orphan. And we could, in principle, keep this block and allow this miner to be, to be paid for this block. If we do that, we eventually need to tie up these two chain tips. So at the point we generated C, we've got two chain tips. We don't know which one to follow. Some miner in the future needs to come along and tie these things together and make a single chain tip, which is the block D, um, which essentially is indicating those, there's no conflict. So the, the second, the last miner, D, is tying these things together and asserting there is no transaction conflict in the entire subset of all of these blocks. So the, the consequence here is that we want to get rid of orphans blocks must have multiple parents. So that's the simple observation. Um, now, let's say there was a double spend in this new, uh, this new block, block C. If there is a double spend, this forms a new chain tip, right? And we all know how this works. We have to evaluate the amount of work in, in B and C and pick which one we're gonna mine on top of. And this is also unavoidable. When there's a double spend, we have to pick one. All right, so this leads down a rabbit hole. This simple observation that I can allow a block to have multiple parents leads to a tremendous amount of complexity, which I'm going to go into now. Um, so the new data structure is called a directed acyclic graph that happens when you allow this kind of, this kind of thing to occur. Another way I like to think about this is, what if we just take blocks and we throw them out as fast as we can, um, let them have multiple parents? Could we make sense of this chaos? Could we make sense of this mess? Um, if we tie all these things together, can we evaluate the amount of work? Can we track chain tips the way we do with Bitcoin with a more complicated data structure? In many ways, the blockchain is an oversimplified data structure. It's a linked list. Um, and of course, you know, the multiple writer database model, I cannot add something to the end of the tip with uh, another person adding something at the same time. So let's move to a slightly more complicated uh, data structure. The, the consequences of this are uh, orphans and selfish mining from this uh, uh, using too simple of a data structure. So a directed acyclic graph, um, first of all, allows blocks to have multiple parents. Uh, directed means that blocks have parents. There are, this is a graph. There are nodes and edges. Those edges have a direction. That direction points from chi children to parents. It does not point from parents to children. So this is all of the links only go one way. That's what directed means. Acyclic means uh, there are no cycles. So I cannot go from a node and then make a circle and come back to myself. This is cryptographically impossible. I would have to break my hash function to do that. And if we break our hash function, we got other problems. Um, and of course, it's a graph. It's not a, it's not a line, it's a graph. Um, a DAG can be partial ordered in linear time, which means by following these parent and child links, I can order the, the succession of transactions, um, and I can do so in linear time. Um, so we have to make one more restriction relative to a general DAG. So I'm gonna call this new data structure a braid. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, so I've drawn a, a graph at the top that is a, a hypothetical braid. Um, a braid is a directed acyclic graph with none of the little red links up there. So basically what I'm saying is each block can have multiple parents, but I'm not going to allow a block to name its own grandparent as a parent. Let's call this incest, okay? So uh, mommy and grandpa can't have babies, because that's gross. Um, I'm going to call the analog of a block a bead, just, just to make the nomenclature clear that I'm not talking about Bit Bitcoin blocks here. This is the new data structure. Um, a sibling is a bead that cannot be partial ordered relative to myself. So in other words, in the graph I've drawn above, B and C are siblings, and E and F are also siblings. All the rest can be ordered, and we can say that uh, A comes before B, C comes before, or D comes before B, etc. Um, an incest is a parent that simultaneously is an ancestor of another parent. So I can't name my grandparent or great-grandparent or anyone up the chain or the genesis block as a parent. Because those links don't actually contain any information. Uh, I can already order the DAG by using the parent information by itself. Adding information about a grandparent doesn't give me any new information I didn't already have. So I'm just going to disallow those kind of links. Um, so this is not a straight DAG, it's a slight restriction on a DAG. So my approach in, in this is that, um, first of all, I'm going to add an incentive. So the second half of the talk is gonna be added, talking about incentives for this. I'm going to explicitly incentivize tra quickly transmitting blocks. Um, Satoshi with Bitcoin did the opposite. Because of the blockchain, he slowed things down to 10 minute blocks 
because of this, uh, this problem of people simultaneously generating blocks. Um, if we get rid of this problem, we can allow blocks to be transmitted as quickly as we want. We don't, in fact, I'm going to get rid of the block time altogether. Um, the ghost uh, paper uh, adds a, another way of uh, making blocks faster by taking account of work in other blocks, but ghost blocks can contain double spends. And this worsens certain kinds of attacks. If I'm an attacker and I'm, I'm playing a double spend game, I can still essentially mitigate my losses on the double spend side of things. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to um, require that parents must not contain conflicting transactions. So just like Bitcoin and unlike Ghost. Um, I'm going to allow a number of things to be decided per node, uh, namely the, the bead time, block time, uh, bead target difficulty, and the size. Uh, so I'm essentially assuming that this, this data structure is going to be a smaller, faster layer below Bitcoin. And we are occasionally going to checkpoint this, this smaller, faster structure into Bitcoin blocks in order to have compatibility with old uh, clients, old Bitcoin D nodes. There are many ways to get this into Bitcoin. Um, I'm not going to go through in great detail how to get this into Bitcoin or exactly what we should do with the peer-to-peer -peer layer, or whether we should mining transactions. I'll leave that for you guys to think about. This is somewhat of a longer term project than some of the other proposals we've heard so far. And we're going to have to evaluate a lot of things. Um, finally, I'm going to publish these beads ex post facto, just like Bitcoin does. Uh, there is another project out there called Bitcoin NG, which I, I think we're hearing about today, or um, uh, which uh, what they do is they kind of in a more traditional computer science way, they elect a leader and that leader is the one who is able to dictate which transactions come next. However, uh, this prevents a new vulnerability, namely, if I can find the leader, I can DDoS him off the network. And it requires uh, me to target fewer nodes to shut down the network than with Bitcoin. With Bitcoin or with this uh, Braid proposal, we would have to DDoS all miners off the network to shut the network down. All right, so here's a, an example, slightly more complicated example of what happens when you have a fork. So let's say there's a double spend. So I have A and B. So these are beads that contain a block of transactions, and there's a double spend between these two. So I have to separate them, right? So miners now have to choose. Am I going to talk about A and, or talk about B when I mine on top of them? I cannot have, as a parent, both A and B, because they're, they're con in conflict. So we have to evaluate which one has the most work. Um, by the way, something I forgot to mention earlier is the consequence of this no grandparent rule, this incest rule, is that when you draw these graphs, they have no triangles. If you think about it, a triangle is explicitly naming a grandparent. So these, these graphs all have essentially uh, um, four-sided figures or higher because of that. Um, so the beads we mine on top of have to reference either A or B. And what we, what we do in this situation is we have to take the subset of beads which um, point back to either A or B, and I have to evaluate the amount of work in the subset. So I have to choose either the blue set or the red set and evaluate how much work is in that sub DAG, that sub uh, group of, of transactions. Um, all right, so that's, that's the basic structure. Um, the next major question is how do you incentivize miners? So we can't do the same thing as we do in Bitcoin. Um, one of the uh, consequences of Bitcoin is that, uh, so Bitcoin has a rule that you can't spend uh, Coinbase transactions for 100 blocks, right? Um, this has to do with uh, not making the UTXO set too large if uh, there's a reorg and things like that. Um, however, it's a fundamental fact that because of the size of the earth and the people do generate these siblings, I can't decide who I should allocate coins to until I can see both sides, right, of the siblings, both of the siblings. So um, instead of not allowing people to spend their coins for 100 blocks and allowing miners to create the coin base, they can't create the coin base. They don't have the information. They can't see all the blocks. I'm going to require that we actually calculate the Coinbase 100 blocks later, rather than calculating it at first and not being able to spend it for 100 blocks. Um, the consensus of this system, the chain tip, is caused by the profit maximizing behavior of the miners. So creating the right incentive is what causes consensus to happen. It, that's what causes the whole thing to work. So we really need to be careful and really think hard about whether we have the right consensus model. If we don't, we're going to have something like a selfish mining attack. And because this is not a cryptocurrency yet, we have time to sit down and think about this and make sure we've got the right incentive model. I'm going to propose something here in a couple slides, but let's all do some analysis in the coming days or coming year 
um, and figure out whether we got the right thing, if this is a path people want to go down. Uh, I'm going to allow miners to individually choose target and block rate based on other considerations. We can measure the amount of work. That's not really a problem. Um, and if we do that, the only limiting factor on the network is bandwidth and CPU. So can I get those blocks out there? Can I evaluate the signatures? These are, this is a CPU bound problem and a network bandwidth bound problem. This is a nice problem to have compared to the artificial restrictions we have from orphans now. Um, so I'm going to define two quantities here, which we'll use in a minor incentive formula. One is siblings, okay? So the sibling, as I already brought up, is a analog to Bitcoin orphans. It's defined as a bead that cannot, cannot be ordered to come before or after my own bead using only the DAG's partial order, okay? So these, the way I'm drawing my graphs, times along the horizontal axis. Uh, I can reorder these beads left and right, but I can't put them earlier than their parent. So if I can put uh, two beads on top of each other so that they could have occurred at the same time and I cannot tell, um, that defines a sibling, okay? Uh, siblings are defined per braid tip. So you, only, you don't care about siblings that have double spends in them. They're somewhere else. Uh, siblings must not contain conflicting transactions. We have to have, uh, th they're part of the same consensus block and they have to not contain, they have to contain uh, a single uh, set of UTXOs. Um, siblings may contain duplicate transactions. The model we have now, we relay transactions via peer-to-peer. -peer. We may upgrade this with IBLT, but we're likely to have blocks that have almost identical transactions. Um, so we're going to explicitly allow that. Uh, if siblings share the same transaction, each sibling will out be allocated a work-weighted fraction of the transaction fee. Um, in other words, if I have two siblings and they're each mining at the same target difficulty, they will each receive one half of the, trans of the transaction fee. The second quantity I'm going to define is called what I call the cohort difficulty. So for the non-English speakers, cohort uh, means a group of people about the same age. It's your classmates um, from school. So the cohort difficulty is the work of other miners during the time window in which I'm mining. I define it as the combined work of all of the beads between my youngest parent and my oldest child. So a, a miner with a large cohort difficulty relative to his own is playing games or following some perverse incentive model. Um, so I want to uh, look at the youngest, youngest parent. In other words, miners in this model would have to retarget their mining equipment often and look at the latest bead that they saw, the latest uh, um, chain tip that they saw. They can, you know, if, you, if a miner sits for an hour and mines on the same thing, this does not create a fast network, right? We're, we're sitting and waiting for an hour for this. Um, and we want to look at the uh, oldest child because that says someone else came along and put more transactions on top of it. And we want that to happen quickly also. So the miner should publish his bead quickly in order to get other miners to mine on top of it quickly. Um, so you might imagine that a miner was trying to steal fees by becoming everyone's sibling. So we're going to explicitly disincentivize that by using this quantity or withholding blocks. In other words, the children arrive late because he's holding on the blocks and not transmitting them. Um, so incentivizing using this quantity, the cohort difficulty, will incentivize uh, fast block transmission. So here's a, here's a diagram of what this looks like. So this is a, a sub uh, braid. So on the left hand side we have A um, and then a group of, of, uh, of beads here. So the, the siblings are the guys in blue. It's G, D, and E. And if you think about siblings are relative to a particular bead, okay? So I'm asking what are the siblings of B? Um, and if any of G or D or E contain the same transaction, B is going to have to split fees with them. Um, and if you look at this graph, times along the horizontal axis, so you can imagine taking B and D and E and G and moving them horizontally, and I can place them in any order. I can't tell which one came first, right? Which is why they're siblings. Um, the cohort of G is the set of beads uh, which are, so the youngest parent of B is C. Uh, the oldest child is F. Only one parent, one child in this example. But we're looking at everybody within that, that sub, subset there, which is D, N, E, and B. So his, his, his self is included in his cohort, okay? Um, and for a quiz, you can think to yourself, what are the siblings of G and the cohort of G? Anybody want to shout it out? What are the siblings of G? Yeah, C, B, D, E, and F. Siblings of G are C, D, E, F, and B, right? If I do the same thing for D, what are the siblings of D? 
B and G, yeah, and its cohort is B and D. Um, okay, so here's, here's my proposed minor incentive formula. Again, we should think hard about this. This is a graph, right? There are a lot of ways to define interesting quantities on this graph that we could explicitly incentivize or disincentivize. So this reward here, R, um, is the sum. So the first term is transaction fees. The second term is Coinbase reward. Uh, each term is proportional to the miner's own difficulty. So that's D in the numerator. Um, the quantity D in the denominator is the cohort difficulty. Oh, I renamed it. It says parallel and closed difficulty. That should be cohort, because that's a better word. Um, so the first term I'm summing over transactions that are in, uh, in among my siblings. Um, N and uh, little n, sorry, n sub t and big N are just normalization factors. Uh, so this has a ratio of little d to big D, which is my own work to uh, my own work relative to the cohort difficulty. Um, the transaction fee is ft. I'm summing over my number of siblings. I'm summing over uh, in the first term. In the second term, the sum is over all of the beads or all of the blocks. Uh, this minor incentive form is, con is constructed such that it is linear in the minor difficulty. What this means is miners can choose their own target difficulty, and by doing so, they smooth out their payout. So rather than having 25 bitcoins and then wait a long time and 25 more bitcoins, I could mine at half the difficulty and get 12 and a half bitcoins on average twice as often. Um, that's what happens because I've made this pr explicitly proportional to his own difficulty. Um, so smaller d means a smoother distribution of income, which is probably uh, valuable to smaller miners. The difficulty weighted split of fees is fair. You know, we're, we're splitting it according to work. Bigger miners will get more money than smaller miners. Um, this causes us to incentivize and optimize the, the peer to peer te uh, topology quickly to quickly propagate blocks. Um, again, we're, we're explicitly incentivizing the uh, work between the youngest parent and the oldest child. So we want to transmit things quickly. The peer to peer topology is essentially random in Bitcoin right now and could be optimized quite a bit to make the network faster. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Uh, this also means smaller miners can mine without joining pools. In many ways, uh, I am pulling P2 pool into, into Bitcoin in some ways. The Coinbase for this kind of thing would look a lot like P2 pool. It would be a long list of outputs that come from collecting the things in the DAG and putting it into a Bitcoin block. Um, at just about a time, we have to evaluate the, le the best braid. Um, Bitcoin has a linear. You just add up the amount of work in each one. This is simplistic. Uh, we can do a lot better. This becomes a measurement problem. I have evidence that you have a hash power based upon your target difficulty and your publication, your proof of work. I can use fancier uh, technology like um, likelihood functions to evaluate whether uh, which, which chain has more work or which braid has more work and which one I will mine on top of. Um, confirmation times, uh, let's just say this. We have a lot more data. I'd like to see a whole class of risk evaluation methods added for different users and different use cases by looking at the amount of work and we've, we've got a lot more data because there's a lot more evidence coming in via proof of work. All right, so let me finish up here. Um, getting rid of orphans forces us into the braid structure. Uh, transaction volume, when I do this, is limited only by bandwidth and CPU. Um, confirmation times can be much faster. We can throw out blocks as fast as we want, limited only by the propagation time to reach the entire network, which is a fundamental limit as the size of the Earth. I'm not going to change that anytime soon. The algorithms here are more complex, but they all seem to be order n. In other words, we're always looking at a, a, a subgraph. We're always including all of that. We don't have to solve the traveling salesman problem, which is an NP-complete problem. If that, if that shows up in these algorithms, that's bad. Um, minor income can become much smoother and more predictable. Uh, in many ways, uh, there are many ways to put this into Bitcoin. So there's lots of simulation and testing necessary, and I'm sure we'll discuss it in the future. This also means smaller miners don't have to use pools which is mining decentralization, something I think we all want. All right, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Do we have any questions for Bob? Okay, we have a few. I'm gonna start with Jorge. Uh, so you said uh, that miners can choose their, their own difficulty, which I yes. find very interesting, but uh, uh, so, what about if they, if, is there a limit on on not doing empty blocks or things like that? Because it, it comes to mind that they, they could produce 
infinite difficulty one blocks and mess with the network? Yes. Like so that? again, how to get this into Bitcoin is another question. So what you're essentially asking is, should there be a floor, uh, a minimum difficulty, maybe? Actions, uh, I don't know. It, I, I'm it skeptical. Seems many empty, low difficulty blocks could be a problem. Possibly. Good question. I mean, this is something we have to engineer into it. I, I have not, I have not done that explicitly. Question over here. Okay. Uh, as I understand, uh, a fork will still happen if there is double spending. Yes. So, would that? All existing problems still there. I mean, when there's a fork, uh, people go selfish mine and. So selfish mining happens because uh, of orphans. So there's no orphans here. Selfish mining doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense to withhold my block. But you will, if there is a fork, then you will, will eventually have a orphan fork, mm -hmm. right? Well, so you have a fork, right? Yeah. And if I want to overtake this other fork, I have to have 51% of the hash power. Selfish mining gets me down to 25%. That doesn't happen here. This brings us back up to 51%. Mm, but, but in your system, you just, instead of uh, have an orphan chain, then now you have a branch of orphan bees with your terminology. Yeah, you have a, you have a branch, and there yeah. will be many beads on the both branches, and so I need to evaluate which one has more work. So what's the difference? Uh, uh, but that's my question. The, di actually. the difference is there's no orphans. So. Uh, the, the fees are split evenly. Um, the, each miner has to choose which one they're going to mine on top of. And the, the, the Satoshi's original analysis that led to 51% is correct, which in Bitcoin it's not correct due to selfish mining. We have a question in the back. So uh, am I right to say that the best way for me to avoid conflict now is to mine um, empty block? Why? Because um, there won't be any conflict transaction with other blocks. So if you want to get some of the transaction fees. Well, the transaction fee will get split if uh, I include the same transaction any yeah, anyway. Yeah, but it, it'll, it'll be split. But and if you don't include it, you get zero. And if I include some conflict transaction, then uh, my block wouldn't, uh, wouldn't get um, included into the blockchain. Well, that, that's always true. I mean, the, the reason um, consensus works in Bitcoin is because miners are forced to choose which branch they're going to take. So if you're throwing out blocks a lot faster, so you throw out one block that has a conflicting transaction, you see that everybody else is mining on another chain. And this happens, you know, seconds later, and you switch. So you don't lose 25 Bitcoins. You, you throw out a small, fast block at low difficulty, you lose 0.1 Bitcoins, and then you switch <coughs> because everybody else is mining on the other chain. So it, that choice is very important. We have to force miners to pick one. Question over here. Yep. Can you can you prevent a selfish miner from uh, publishing a lot of conflicting transactions to the other miners and then degenerating this into the regular Bitcoin model of, of one long chain? Uh, so I think what you're essentially asking is somebody could publish a whole lot of conflicting transactions, yes. generate a lot of chain tips, yep. right? So anybody could do that. You can do that in Bitcoin too. Um, the only ones that actually matter are ones that get mined, right? So I don't get a chain tip until something gets mined. So throwing out all those transactions, I, I think one, one of the ideas behind this is that we could switch to a model where we get rid of the peer-to-peer -peer relay layer and we mine everything. So throwing out a bunch of transactions for free doesn't cause any problem. It's only when they, when they get mined. And then I have to start evaluating who's mining what and which one has more work. So that is, that is an attack, but it's also an attack with Bitcoin. That's not something new. Ruotsuyanigafentadwa Okay, so he said, the question was, if there is a um, split, a fork, mm -hmm. or orphan, then, uh, he, he says, so, so miners can choose which of the two, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, the two braids, braids. to, to uh, 
to mine. Say lah. 一个负负的 block 还是两个负的 block 去挖？选自己去选择一个不一个负的 block 还是两个负的 block， 然后去挖。他要改那个那个 block 结构嘛？ So the miners are forced to choose which one to mine on. 对，一个。问题什么？问问题什么？就是这样的话，会不会造成那个算力的费浪费 ？Will that cause a waste of hashing power? No. When so, I, I thought about throwing some plots in here from the Bitcoin NG paper. They defined a number of interesting quantities, including、uh, miner utilization. Miner utilization here is 100 percent. So the graph almost doesn't make any sense. The miner utilization only goes down if there's、uh, double spends. And, but then miners have to choose. But that's exactly what we want miners to be doing. That's why miners exist. That's their job, is to pick one and create the chain of consensus. So, not waste energy. Okay. No more questions. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker is Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan Sampolinski, and he will be speaking about breaking the chains of blockchain protocols. Hey, thanks for having me.、Um, this is a fresh work、um, from the recent days, weeks.、Um, this is a joint work with my advisor Aviv Zohar from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, and my colleague Yoav Dornberg.、Um, okay, breaking free from the chains of blockchain protocols. So, what's that about? So, the motivation for this work is our daydream for Bitcoin. We're envisioning, for the long term, a Bitcoin that processes、uh, several thousand transactions per second,、um, several megabytes per second, and we wanted, we were interested in doing so in a secure manner. And this is so. This is the long term vision for our long term vision for Bitcoin. And If you can think of 2,000 or 10,000 transactions per second, that's what Visa processes nowadays. So we would like to get there. So in this work, we define a new family of blockchain protocols, which makes use of, of ordinary Bitcoin、uh, blocks. Okay, so we don't use、uh, micro blocks or synch different synchronization. We st we stick to the bit、uh, ordinary Bitcoin model. We have a minor、um, Mine, uh, miners mine blocks, and this is an in-chain solution to the scalability security trade-off. So it's orthogonal to any off-chain solutions, like network, etc. They are both、uh, compatible, and we want to、um, uh, achieve a scalable protocol that will、um, that will be able to process、uh, several megabytes per second. So that's our goal. Okay. So as Bob mentioned. This is this is perhaps the basic picture for scalability security trade-off in Bitcoin. Once you increase the throughput of Bitcoin, then many forks occur occur, occur in the network, and you have this、uh, longest chain, which is now only about a, could could be in this picture a half of the mining power. And and this fork this fork network has multiple consequences. So now I'll go through. The consequences of of this、um, of this、uh, forking of the network. There are several attacks、uh, in which、uh, there are several ways in which the attacker can use this forking of the network to his own benefit. Okay, so the first attack is the classical classic、uh, double spending attack. And here, the miner、um, waits for the user to confirm the transaction, and after the confirmation. He publishes his secret、uh, ch chain of blocks, and the crucial point here is that the miner waits for the confirmation, and after the confirmation, he publishes his blocks in an attempt to reverse the payment. Okay, so this is after confirmation. Okay, so we have the blue, the blue, the blue transaction is the honest transaction. It's contained in the block B, and the conflicting transaction is in the is contained in the in the red、uh, secret chain. And once the user accepted block B, the, the attacker publishes his secret chain of blocks. So this is the famous double spending attack. 
Another attack on, uh, on this uh, data structure is the censorship attack. And in censorship attack, the aim of the attacker is, is the opposite. Instead of reversing payments after confirmation, the attacker aims to prevent confirmations by publishing his blocks very fast. So the aim of the attacker here is to gain control over the main chain. Once it has, it, it, would, it succeeded in gaining control over the main chain, it publishes empty blocks to the main chain, and then everyone is denied of the service. No user can accept his transactions, right? And when the attacker has sufficient computational power and sufficient communication capabilities, he's able to, to succeed with this attack. So this attack is the, the opposite attack of double spending because it prevents, prevents confirmation rather than, rather than reversing them. A similar attack is the delayed acceptance attack. And in this scheme, again, the attacker wants to prevent confirmations and not reverse confirmations. And the way he does so is by helping shorter com competing chains to survive or, or weaker competing chains to survive. Okay, so the attacker sees there are some chains in the network that can be supported by his mining power, so he shifts his mining power to these chains, and, and, and because there's many forks in the network, natural forks in the network, he's able to manipulate uh, nodes to, to work on off-chain blocks. And what happens here is that a, a cautious uh, merchant, um, which has, say, the, the blue transactions, won't accept the transaction because he sees there are endangering close uh, chains, competing chains that are close to, to override it. And so, again, this scheme enables an attacker to prevent confirmations from occurring in the network. Okay, so let's, let's sum up this security scalability trade-off in Bitcoin. In this table, you see the three attacks, the double spending attacks in the aim of reversing payments, and then the censorship and the delayed acceptance attack in an attempt to delay confirmations and prevent confirmations indefinitely. And what you can see here is that the longest chain protocol deteriorates as the throughput is increased, which means that security threshold um, go, vanishes as the throughput is increased. So um, Bitcoin, the longest chain Bitcoin's rule is uh, susceptible to double spending, to censorship. It is not susceptible to delayed acceptance. The ghost protocol is resilient to double spending, even in, under high throughput. However, it is susceptible to censorship and to delayed acceptance. And we were thinking whether we can create an ideal protocol which gets 50% thresh computational thresh uh, security threshold for all attacks. Okay, so unfortunately the answer is yes or almost yes. Okay, so we'll see in the, in the um, continuation of this talk, um, how to construct such a protocol. Okay, so the main insight here is that chains are vulnerable. Okay, once you use a chain and you give the chain the entire authority over the network, you are susceptible to manipulations and to censorship. And to avoid this, you want to utilize all the mining power and all the contents of all blocks and you want all the blocks to participate in the process of, of transactions confirmations. You don't want to use a select subset of history. And the second insight here is that once you um, provide a serialization, a total serialization of the block, of the tra incoming transactions, then you, then you recover the consistency that chains provide you. You don't need to use chains in order to, to, to have consistency. And I will show this now. Okay, so as Bob mentioned, the first step here is to uh, instruct every block to point at all predecessors it sees. Okay, but contrary to, to Bob's um, proposal, we do it um, regardless of conflicts in, in, uh, in uh, what Bob called siblings. I'll just call it um, siblings of the gray. Um, so here, uh, block D1 has, uh, he sees C1 and B2, and he should point at both, regardless of their contents. Um, so that's the first step to, for all, every block to point at all predecessors. 
And this, this uh, transforms the ledger from a chain to, to a DAG, and we don't restrict how the DAG should be, there's no, there's no restriction on, on this DAG. And the only thing we need to do is, we need to define a new consistency rule to solve these, doubles, these possible potential conflicts within um, blocks. So in, for instance, if C1 and B2 have a double spend, we need to, to specify how does D1, the block D1, um, view the, um, the, this conflict? Views this conflict, how does it resolve this conflict? Okay, so this is a much more complex setup, yet it's more powerful. Okay, so the, the prime observation of this work is that you only need to provide a linear ordering on the blocks of the DAG in order to, to, to achieve consistency. Okay, you don't need to have a chain. It's enough to, to, to agree, all nodes, for all nodes to agree on how to transform a block DAG into a, an, into a chain or to a linearization of the block DAG. For instance, assume there's the, the block DAG on the, on the bottom left and it has all these transactions, then if the order on the right, on the bottom right, is agreed upon by all nodes, then the algorithm to, to uh, interpret the worldview of this DAG is, is simple, iterate over the blocks in this agreed order and confirm every transaction that is consistent with those that, you have, conf that you, confirmed, you have confirmed thus far. For instance, you, you start with the, the block A here, the yellow transaction is accepted, then you iterate to the next block in order, B2, if the blue transaction is cons consistent with the yellow transaction, you confirm it, et cetera, et cetera. You go to B1. If the green transaction is, is consistent with the yellow and the blue one, you confirm it, and so on and so forth. Okay, so once you provided a linear ordering that is agreeable on all nodes, then you, you, you have achieved consistency. And of course, you can't just simply provide a, a, a linear ordering that everyone agrees on, you have to have some good properties of this ordering. For instance, you want it to be resilient to revisions, right? You want if, if uh, one block, if my block precedes your block, now I want it, I, want, I need a guarantee that with high probability, this will remain so. And likewise, if, I, if, I, if there's a secret chain of blocks that it's not published, I want this, block, these, this, secret, this secret chain of blocks to, to be later in the order in order to prevent it from being injected in line and, and um, throwing out valid transactions, right? So these are good properties we want from, a, from an ordering. And I must say it's not, it's not, a, it's not an easy, it, it's not easy a task. So we tried, we played with many protocols, many naive protocols, and we were able to manipulate all of them and to, to attack them. So that's, that's sort of a motivation why, why the following protocol, which I will present, is a bit compli complicated. OK, so here's a specifi specification of our new protocol. There's still a heated debate about the name, so I'll just name it our new protocol. So here's the specification. We, we have a given DAG, and we want to know how to order it. So the first step here is to decide between each pair of blocks what should be the pairwise relation between them. Sorry, so assume we have E and F, a pair of blocks. So every block in the entire DAG votes whether E should precede F or vice versa. And the way it votes is, depends on, on its location in the DAG. If C has E or F in its past, if it knows, uh, the, if, it, if, if, if E and F are contained in its history, then you can simply assume in a recursion call that we already decided the order that C views in his sub DAG, right? So we are a new DAG. We want to know how to order E and F. You can assume that by recursion of the protocol, you already ordered E and F according to C's view. And of course, we need to specify, specify a base case for this for this recursion, so we specify that C votes that it's that C it precedes every block outside its history. Okay, so I'm a new, I'm, a, I'm mining a new block. 
I vote for the order between all the blocks I know, and I vote that I precede every block that I don't know. And the, the second case is, and this is the interesting and subtle case, is when, is when E and F are both unknown to, to C. And our protocol dictates that C takes a majority of votes in its future to decide whether E and F, which, is an, which, it, it, which it is unaware of, what's the relation between them. Okay, and I will demonstrate it um, sh uh, shortly. After we decided what's the pairwise relation between these blocks, we provide a linearization of the entire block DAG, which is, was uh, our initial task. We do, we do so using the Schultz method, which is a bit uh, complex, and I won't, I, I'm afraid I won't have time to go over here. And note that under no delays, when a network suffers no delays, then our protocol coincides with longest chain and ghost, so it has the same flavor of accumulating mining power and, and uh, ma majority amplification. And, um, and we proved the, the resilience of this protocol to all attacks, to double spending, to censorship, and to delayed acceptance. OK, so let's, let's um, uh, visualize this protocol. Assume we have two transactions, E and F. And now we want to know two blocks, E and F, and we want to know whether E should precede F or vice versa. Now, before I begin visualizing this, note that the top, that the bottom chain is obviously an attacker chain because no block in the in the top DAG has links to this chain. Okay, so obviously now only now that the chain was published because honest blocks didn't point at it till now. And so hopefully our protocol will let E precede F. Okay, we want E to precede F in the order because F, the secret, the, the chain of F didn't publish itself. Okay, so the first step is to infer the, uh, interpret the, the vote of, of, of blocks uh, in the future of E and F. And as I said, this can be safely assumed as a recursion call, just call our protocol in a recursion and and in this case, we have that um, all the blocks in E's future vote to, uh, to that E precedes F, so they become blue, and all the vote and all the blocks in F's, F's future vote that F precedes E. Okay, so this is a simple part. Now we have a block. Uh, the yellow block here has no idea whether E should precede F or not, so it takes a majority over its future. So what you see here is that there are two blue blocks atop this yellow block, therefore it, it becomes blue as well. Likewise, this block, the yellow block now, becomes red because a majority over it, atop it, um, votes is red, etc., etc. And now we have an interesting case where a, a, a yellow block has also bl uh, blue blocks in its future, also red blocks in its future, so it takes majority and it becomes blue and then our protocol uh, collapses, and finally the genesis block is blue, and we're satisfied that the transaction, the, 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 the blue block, E, precedes F, and therefore when our algorithm, algorithm will, um, algorithm for consistency will iterate over the order, then E will be come before F, and the transaction of E will be approved, and then when E will be iterated upon, when F will be iterated upon, the red transaction will be rejected because it's inconsistent with E. Okay, let me now demonstrate how, how this protocol is resilient to censorship. So, assume the, top, the, the bottom chain is a miner which publishes its blocks but is not interested in acknowledging your blocks. Okay? So we have the, red, the blue transaction in block E and the, the bottom chain doesn't, doesn't uh, cooperate in, uh, in, the, in the efforts of um, piling confirmations atop E. So our protocol first dictates that all these, uh, the, the blocks that I marked now blue, see only E in the future, they don't see any conflicting transaction, therefore they are colored E, they are colored blue. Then blocks in their past are colored blue likewise because our protocol dictates that you take a majority over your future. 
And then, in this process, even the, attack, the censorship blocks become blue. Okay, so because honest blocks point at the attacker's blocks, at the censorship uh, blocks, they point at censorship, censorshiping blocks, then they force, essentially, these blocks to support the security of E, although the, 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 top, the bottom chain didn't point at E. So this is a feature where, you, where blocks that are published um, are, are enhance the security of all published honest transactions, and that's, in that way, you, you counter censorship. Okay, the, the, um, the, as I said, the next stage of this algorithm is to take these pairwise relations and to aggregate them into a linearized linearization of the block DAG. This is not a trivial task since cycles may form, right? So there's the famous Condorcet paradox where a, a majority, there could be a, a case where a majority says that A should, should um, come after B, a majority says that B should come after C, and a majority says that C should come after A. So you can't just simply say a majority said, uh, take the majority of A over B and lock this uh, order because cycles may form. So you need to use some more complex methods. And we use the Schultz method, which aggregates uh, these, these um, pairwise relations in some um, more wise manner. And, and also, we need to provide a policy for the user, for the merchant, how to... Questions? Oh. Um, we need to, to provide a policy for the user and merchant. Uh, we, we do so. We do so in a faster manner than long as chain goes. So wrapping up, our new protocol is resilient, provably re resilient to all three attacks, almost. Um, so it's totally resilient to double spending. It's totally resilient to censorship attack, and it's almost totally resilient to delayed acceptance. If you're an honest node and you don't double spend your transactions, then you're not susceptible to delayed acceptance. But if you double spend your transactions visibly, publish, um, you behave uh, dishonestly, then, then you're susceptible to delayed acceptance. So um, we can say that's a fair, you don't behave nicely, you can be attacked. Um, we are working on a patch for mining fees how to, there's a peculiar, peculiar um, case where uh, mining fees uh, can be susceptible to delayed acceptance. We have a patch for it. We, we're working on formalizing it and an incentive and an SPVs. And let's summarize. The longest chain rules um, may not be scalable, but Bitcoin can be scalable if we adopt DAGs that utilize the entire mining power and the entire effort of all miners and we encourage Bitcoins around the world to, to uh, adopt chains, to adopt DAGs, and abandon their chains. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Questions? Short time for questions. Over here. Can you describe what happens when two nodes receive uh, conflicting transactions at different times and, and yeah. Skip the so let's say one node publishes its block with TX and the other one with TX prime. Then simply the, the third node will, will point at both blocks. And if, if, they're, if, the, if they're really in a tie, then it, it needs to break ties like in Bitcoin. You need to break ties between competing chains. So it, it break ties, say it's, it says the TX prime is the, the block of TX uh, precedes TX prime, then TX is approved, TX prime is rejected. Hi. Um, in this slide where you were showing how the, the majority of the blues would win over the, the red attacking chain in the delayed acceptance, or, or it might have been the double spend attack, I'm not sure. But did that slide um, sort of imply that you need the other kind of shorter orphaned chains in the blue side in order to have the majority over the red? If it was just one blue chain shorter than competing against one red chain, then the red would have the majority, would it not? Yeah, if you have a majority of the mining power that is censoring uh, a shorter chain, then it's 54% attack. So we're only resilient to a 50% attack. We can't be resilient to more than that. Right? So in your case, you have a longer chain that's consistent. That's 
that's supported by 51 percent. So in the, in the same slide, uh, he mentioned, uh, 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 I think it's reversible that the Genesis block ends up being blue, but what if the, the blue part stops being extended, then from now on only the red part coming into the blue part is extended. Uh, wouldn't everything turn red? So once, uh, once all nodes, honest nodes see, see our DAG, they just amplify our decision. They amplify our, our decision. Yeah, but uh, what if uh, if what well, you're defining as honest node there is just stop mining or disappear? And so uh, consider the case where the network suffers no delays. Yeah. So our protocol coincides with longest chain. And what happens in longest chain when uh, s suddenly the honest chains no one no one continue is mining on it and they're just mine so on the on the published shorter chain that's the same attack uh, there's no difference here you the, the security analysis of Bitcoin assumes that once you've published your honest honest chain and you your the protocol favors you all, all honest nodes support you okay so the voting is based on like future blocks how do you know that um, how? I really understand the oh, uh, we don't. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, a block doesn't really vote on the future. We just interpret its vote on the future. So um, we just use the, the the blocks vote on the future to penalize uh, um, secret blocks that were mined in parallel to it. But you're correct that it's not a real uh, vote that's embedded in it, the header. Rather, it's uh, and the new virtual block that is mined needs to interpret this block's vote regarding the future. So it's 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 just an algorithm. We don't require really a block. We don't really require a block to vote on the future. It's just an, an algorithmic interpretation. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Our next speaker is Loy Liu. And we're speaking about SCP, a computationally scalable Byzantine consensus protocol. All right. Um, good. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Loy Liu. I'm a PhD student from NUS Singapore, and um, I'm, go I'm going to talk about uh, our protocol SCP, which is a, a scalable Byzantine consensus protocol that can um, allow you to uh, process, say, you know, 10,000 transactions per second, uh, or even more. So this is John Wood with my team from NUS uh, Singapore. Um, so I guess uh, we are all here because Bitcoin doesn't scale. And uh, we have several hard-coded uh, parameters in, in Bitcoin, like you know, one block per 10 minutes, like you know, one MB block size, and that put a theoretical hard limit of seven transactions per, uh, per second to the, to the protocol. Uh, but in practice, it's even worse. So right now, Bitcoin can support only one or two transactions per second. And in the meantime, you know, other credit card, I mean, centralized system like Visa, they can support up to 10,000 10, generations per second. So how are we gonna compete with them? I mean, it's hard to believe that, that we can. Um, so in this work, I, uh, we propose a new solution, um, a new protocol, we can scale up the generation throughput se uh, by several orders of magnitude without uh, degrading any secur security guarantee. And um, we do that by, uh, allow, uh, by allowing several blocks in uh, each epoch. And the, nu and the number of epochs will depend on the network computational uh, power, like you know, the mining power of the network. And we also have the mechanism to require a minimum amount of network bandwidth. Um, for, um, for example, we only broadcast only one block header at every epoch, regardless of how many blocks that you have. All right, um, before I tell you how we do that, uh, let's go through the background first to make sure that everyone has, um, everyone are on, on the same page, is on the same page. So um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies solve uh, an instance of uh, a Byzantine consensus problem. So the problem here is, you know, we have uh, the, a network of N nodes and F of them are malicious. So all the nodes will propose and agree on one bit value, like, you know, zero or one. And the properties that we want from this value is that you know all the nodes will, um, all the honest nodes will uh, agree on the value, and this value won't be uh, um, manipulated by the malicious node. 
So uh, then we have the Byzantine consensus for blockchains that uh, Bitcoin, you know, other consensus, pro uh, other cryptocurrency use. So at, uh, so the protocol happens in, in epochs and at every epoch we uh, agree on a set of value generation uh, so that we are going to extend a pen um, to the blockchain. And the validity, the validity, the validity of the generation will depend on, this, uh, st on the state of the blockchain that, that you're working on. Um, so um, the classical Byzantine consensus uh, problem uh, has been intensively uh, studied in the, in the um, research community. And we have several um, practical solutions we can tolerate 